Scripture. We're going to be in Job chapter 1, okay? Job 1. We're actually going to start going through this long Old Testament book of Job. All right? It, it's, it's an amazing story of one man's struggle, but yet the amazing grace of a living Savior over this one man's life. Job chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in, in the land of us whose name was Job. That man was blameless, upright, fearing God, turning away from evil. Seven sons and three daughters were born to him. His possessions were also 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, very many servants. And that man was the greatest of all the men of the east. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one of his day, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When the days of feasting had completed their cycle, Job would send and consecrate them, rising up early in the morning and offering burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, Perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did this continually. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before, before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From roaming about on the earth, walking around on it, the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? For there was no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fears God, turning away from evil. Satan's answer or response to the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge about him, his house, and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the works of his hand, his possessions have increased in the land. But put forth your hand now and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. You may be seated. So you've probably read the story before. You know the main person in the story outside of the Lord God himself is Job. He was a man who was, who was upright. He was a man who was upright. And we're going to look in the story of Job's life and, and Lord willing, aptly apply it back to our own lives as we serve the Lord Jesus Christ, as we come in to worship the Lord. Now there's no indication, if you know anything about this story, Job, Job would be tested by God Satan would be the one who, who puts the turns the vice down on him, if you will. And we don't know the length of Job's testing. We don't know how long he would go through this. We know at least months we've got that down just by a few things that are mentioned in this, in this story, in this book of Job in the Old Testament. But we do not know how long actually he went through all this, all this testing and all these trials. But we do know this according to, according to Scripture, okay? According to Scripture, as, as, as we look in, in Job's life, I want you to, to remember that according to Scripture, if you, you don't have to, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, Though our bodies are dying and our spirits are being renewed every day, for our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vast outweighs them and will last forever. So let's not look on what we can see now. We fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen, for the things we now will see will be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. So Paul reminds us, 
Paul's reminding us what in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, just very, just very quickly, Paul's reminding us there. He's saying, listen, he says, this is what? Things of this world are what? They're but a light affliction. They're but a light affliction. He also reminds us in Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory He will reveal to us later. So as you're reading this, as we're going through this story of, of Job, remember that, and I know it's going to be tough, it might be tough if you really pay attention to what's going on, you'll see this man is going to go through some pretty horrific things He's going to go through some struggles. He goes through a lot of loss. But we're assured just in those few verses, those few passages of Scripture, that, that this is a momentary light affliction as to what we go through in our lives. Okay, And, and even in Job's life, it's, it's, I know it's, it's easy to say on this side, if you will, not being the one who's having to go through it, or not being the one that's been diagnosed with some with some horrible disease or you know losing family members but no matter how bad it is in our in our lives remember this no matter how bad and how tough the search situation is that we go through in our in our lives we're promised that none of this compares to the glory that awaits us right that glory doesn't await us by it and because of what we've done. That glory awaits us by and because of what Jesus Christ, the one we just got done learning about through the book of Hebrews, that is sitting at what? Hebrews 1.3 at the right hand of the Father. The glory that we got coming is because of what He has done. The glory that Job had coming was because of what Christ has done. Even in the Old Testament, as we've seen in the past, it what? It is all announcing the glory, in the Old Testament, the glory of the coming one, the Lord Jesus Christ. So let us remember that as we're going through this, this book of Job. It says there was once a man named Job. It, it, this, the the author, whoever he was, and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, immediately lets us know, as the stage is set, that we're going to be dealing with this man by the name of Job, who lived in a land of Uz or Oz. He was blameless, a man who had complete integrity. He feared God and he stayed away from evil or he kept himself from evil. Now listen. Now remember when I first got saved many years ago there was a I used to work around a gentleman who was a pastor down in Rogersville and I remember he told me this one time. He said he said he said do you know he said there's another sinless perfect man in scripture. This is what this guy told me. And I said, "Well, who was that?" you know? I was really confused and he and he said, "Well, it, well, it was Job." Okay, he looked at the scriptures and the KJV language and whatever other languages and when it says that he's perfect, you know, he looked at that as he was a sinless man. But listen, Job was not a sinless man, okay? And you pick that up in scripture also. You pick it up in, in Job 6.24. You pick it up in 7.21 of the book of Job. Job was not a sinless man. There's only one sinless one, Right? That was the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? But he was a man who had a lot of integrity. He was a man who, who was complete with a lot of integrity. Integrity. So according to Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the just, what? Habakkuk 2, 4, the just shall live by what? Faith. Romans 1.17, the just shall live by faith. Hebrews 10.38, it mentions again, the just shall live by faith. He was a very faithful man, is what he was. He was a very faithful man. He honored the Lord. He honored the Lord God. He stayed true to Him. 
And you will find in this, in this story of Job that what you're going to see is a picture of a believer in the Lord God who goes through trials and sufferings but yet does not walk away though it would become extremely difficult in his life. In reality, we mentioned this in a long time ago, there's four types of soil. If you remember back in Matthew chapter 13, verse 1 through 9, the parable of the soils. You got these parable of the soils and it's mentioned that, that one of the parables of the soils is, is, is as, as the heat's turned up, as the persecution comes, the one who's not of the faith pretty much packs his or her bags in and they, and they walk away and, because they truly never were of the faith. But you'll see here as the heat's turned up on this true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, though he does kick and scream, though he does fuss and doesn't understand of what he's going through, he never truly turns away, turns his back on the Lord God. See, the truth is for us as believers as it was for Job, as it was for everybody in Scripture, as it was for everybody in the past as believers, and us today in the present and those in the future. Your testing as a Christian, your trial as a Christian is going to come. It's going to come. It's just a reality. For some it comes harder than others. Those that find themselves in a, in a, in a daily service for the Lord Jesus Christ can attest to this, and I've made mention this in, 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 in the past, no Christian's exempt, but it seems like those that, those that push and long to serve the Lord Jesus Christ more in, 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 their, in their life, it seems like they battle with it more and more than other believers do that pretty much just, just sit back and sit in the pews or really don't do much. It might be two years into your service for Christ. It might be 12 years. It might be 22 years. But mark my word, your testing and your trial is going to come. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to prove one way or another who you are. And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ is going to do with Job. But there's going to be a leash on Satan. Satan is going to have a leash on him. And he's only going to be able to go as far as the Lord God allows and we're going to see that as the storyline moves on. He fears God and he stays away from evil. He has seven sons and three daughters. He's blessed, he's blessed with a large family. He's blessed with a large family. Seven sons and three daughters. Very tight family. He's not only blessed with a large family, but he's a very wealthy man. He's a very wealthy individual. How do we know that? Because back in this day, wealth wasn't pretty much measured like it is today. Wealth back in this day was measured by what? It was measured by what you had as far as farmland, as what you had as far as cattle. That's how you measured wealth. Okay? And this man the Lord has blessed tremendously. Even if he only had one sheep, one camel, or one donkey, he, he would still be a blessed man if, if, he, if he's a believer. But you see here, the Lord chose to bless him in such a different way by giving him 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 oxen, team of oxen, and 500 female donkeys. He's loaded. He's loaded with an amazing crop of animals I guess he also has many servants he also has many servants he's blessed with many people around him who are pretty much at his every whim who are pretty much there when he needs something it says he was in fact the richest person in the entire area at that time He's blessed tremendously. A side note, the thing about worldly riches and the Lord Jesus Christ has made mention about this in the New Testament 
it's, it's very hard in our language today. It's, it's very hard for what? It's very hard to have a lot of worldly things, but yet serve the Lord Jesus Christ faithfully. That's a rare person. That's a very rare person. And the Lord Jesus Christ mentioned that. It's a very rare person to find. If you bump into somebody that's extremely blessed with worldly things, earthly things, and you, but yet is a very faithful person to the Lord Jesus Christ, that is a rare person that you've met. Because usually what happens is this. They either lean one way or the other. Okay? Everybody does. But here you see Job was very rare because he has so much blessing. The richest person in the entire area, but yet he has this overwhelming desire to what? This overwhelming desire to serve his God, to serve his Lord. We can all learn a little bit from Job's life and his over, overwhelming desire. Listen to what it says as you move down in verse 4. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one of his day. They would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When the days of feasting had completed their cycle, Job would send and consecrate them, rising up early in the morning, offering burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, Perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job would do this what? He would do this offering continually. Continually. This is an indication. This is an indication of the depth of Job's devotion. To who? To his children? No. To depth of Job's devotion to his God, to his Lord. He was devoted to to him he had devotion to his kids no doubt but you see clearly how devoted he is right off the bat how, how, how much integrity he has in serving his Lord his God the very one who chose him this was Job's regular practice this was his regular practice. He longed, he desired to see his children what? Follow after himself? No. He longed and had a desire to see his children follow after the Lord. To seek the Lord. To be devoted to the Lord. To have a life of integrity. To be the example to the people around them. He longed to see them faithful to the Lord. And he set the example for them. Did he not? He set the example for them. To maybe. They too. Would grow to be devoted men and women. Of the truth. Of the true God. Of the one and only true God the Lord Jesus. It's just a really quick rundown of who Job was from 1 verse 1 on, on down to about verse, verse 5. But here's the trial. Here's the trial. Here's the test. This is what I said before. Your testing as a Christian will come it's a measurement as to how much and how mature you are as a believer. Okay? It's an indicator as to how mature you are as a believer. It's an indicator how much you can handle as a believer. I got to thinking about this this week as, as I talked to this friend of mine, Mr. Mr. Reitmeyer, as he told me, he said, he said Dave, he said, the, the, the cancer is not only in my prostate, he spread to my it's spread to my spine, it's, it's spread to my lymph nodes, and into my bones. He's a wonderful, godly man, a, a minister of the gospel for many, many years. And we got to talking, and I thought to myself when I, when I left, I, I, I thought, it's very interesting. We, 
we prepare ourselves day after day after day as, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, to serve the Lord Jesus Christ faithfully, to serve Him faithfully, to serve Him lovingly, to worship Him. We do that in our everyday life for the most part as believers in Christ. But how many of us truly prepare ourselves for the tests? How many of us truly prepare ourselves for the trials that come our way? I mean, I, I, I'd say it's, it's truth to say that 99.9% .9 of us do not prepare ourselves properly for when the announcement comes that death is around the corner and how well do we prepare ourselves not only for the test and the trial but how well do, do we prepare ourselves for death as a believer in Christ and here how well do we prepare ourselves for testing and trials that may come to us or our loved ones our friends or families and we bear it with them. We walk through it with them. See, Job's going to have friends around him that are going to have the opportunity to walk through this testing and trial with him. And at times, they're not going to do it very well. One day, the members of the heavenly court that come to present themselves before the Lord accuser Satan comes with them where have you come from the Lord asks Satan in verse 6 and 7 where have you come from the Lord asks see who's the one who's controlling the show the Lord God is right as the stage is being set we're, we're told immediately were let in immediately who calls the shots. The Lord knows where Satan has come from, but he asked him this question anyway. From where have you come? He asked a great accuser. From where have you come? If you remember 1 Peter chapter 5, remember 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 8? For Satan is like what? A roaring lion. Seeking whom he may devour. See, remember first, see, next time you read 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, remember the first chapter of Job. Satan was moving about, right? As Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. He's moving about. Seeking whom he can devour. Why does he move about in such a way? One reason is because he is what? He's the father of the world, isn't he? He's the father of the world. You pick that up in John chapter 12. You pick that up in John chapter 16. And John chapter 14 mentions that Satan is the father, is the, is the father of the world. He's your enemy. He's your enemy. The world is his war zone. Make no mistake about it. Do not live your life in some sense that there is no spiritual warfare to be, to be looked at in your everyday life. Because listen to me. The accuser of you is longing to what? Destroy you. Destroy you. He's longing to do that. And he's moving about. Why is he moving about? Because he's not omnipresent. I mean, because, yeah, he's not omnipresent. He's moving about. Seeking whom may devour. One day the members of the heavenly court they come to present themselves before the Lord and the accuser Satan comes with them. Or if you come, the Lord asks. Satan answers the Lord pretty much this in verse 7. Basically what he's saying in, in verse 7. 
from roaming about the earth, walking around on it. I've been patrolling my, my, my war zone. I've been watching everything I can. Been patrolling it. Keeping an eye on it. Walking around. Watching everything that's going on. And if I can't watch it, my demons do for me. And they report back. Then the Lord asked Satan, Have you noticed? Have you considered my servant Job? Have you considered Job? This is interesting. Because immediately, immediately, Satan's response is what? Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on earth. He's blameless, upright man. He fears God. He fears me. He turns away from evil. Satan's immediate response is this. His response is in knowing who Job is. And he knows all about him. Satan answers the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? Does Job fear God for nothing? His reply is, Job has good reason to fear you. Is what Satan's response. Satan is basically saying this. You have blessed him. You have blessed Job tremendously. You have given him 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 team of oxen, 500 female donkeys. He's got more servants than he needs. In fact, he's the richest man in the entire area. He has good reason to fear you. He has good reason. You've kept this wall around him. You've kept me from going in to the other side of the wall, if you will. You've kept this hedge of protection around him and his home and his property. It's you. Satan's right on this. It's you who've made him prosper. Right? Satan's exactly right. It, it's you who've made him <laughs> prosper in everything he does. Do you remember that? If there's prosperity in your life, if some, you're prospering in something, it's the Lord God who has allowed it and willed it to happen. Satan says it's you. It's you who's allowed him to prosper. It's you who's placed the wall of protection around him and not only him, his home and his property. Giving him so much. So he's basically saying, look how rich this guy is. Can't touch him. This is the scene and this is a scene in heaven. Think about this. Can't touch this guy. But reach out. Reach out. Take everything he has from him. He's going to curse you. He's going to cuss you. He simply says in verse 11, Put forth your hand now and touch all that he has. He will surely curse you to your face, God. Curse you to your face. He's been blessed, but take it all away. Test him, and he'll curse you. Test in Scripture, at this point of Scripture, literally means to, to prove by trial. To prove by trial. Remember what I said at the beginning. You as a believer will be proved by trial. You as a believer will be proved 
by trial. See, in our mindset today, in our American culture, and when somebody claims they're a Christian, we take it at face value when we run with it or whatever, and you know, and there's no proving there. It's but here when we're gonna read about this test on Job's life, it literally means going to prove his what? Going to prove his uprightness. Going to prove his loyalty. Going to prove his devotion to the Lord God by what? Trial. Trial. It's one thing to say you're devoted. It's another thing to prove it. Right? It's one thing for a husband or wife to say they're devoted to one another, but it's another to prove it. It's the one thing to say you're devoted to your, your, your work in a sense of to do them a good job because they, they hired you for that, and, and not just do them a good job when the boss is in the area, but to do them a good job when he, he or she is out of the area. To prove it. He's made him prosper in everything he does. Take it all away. He says, take it all away from him. He'll curse you. He'll curse you to your face. And then we got the response of the Lord God in verse, in verse 12. It says this. And the Lord says to Satan... Okay. Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not put forth your hand on him. So Satan immediately departs from the presence of the Lord. Unbeknownst to Job, the trial is about to start, the testing is about to start. It's going to be like anything, anything he's ever experienced before. It's about to begin. James says this in James chapter 1, verse 2, Dear brothers and sisters, when trials of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow, to prove itself. Let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, learning to need nothing. James is saying in James chapter 1, verse 2, he's telling the brothers and sisters in his letter, trouble's going to come your way. Trials are going to come your way. Testing's going to come your way. But consider it an opportunity. Now, I'm not naive enough to think that I'm just going to, when trials and testing comes my way, whenever it does, and it has in the past, and times in the past, and we all go through it from time to time, whatever trials and testings, that when they do come, how many of us truly consider an opportunity for great joy? Remember what I said before, it's a measure of your faith. It's a measure of your endurance, of your maturity. James says, your faith is going to be tested and it's going to have a chance to grow when it comes. It's going to have a chance to grow. Let it grow. If you've been through a trial, if you've been through a test recently and you're coming out on the back end, I hope and pray you learned from it whatever it was. I hope and pray you've learned from it. I hope and pray you've grown from it. Because more than likely, this is what's going to happen. Somewhere down the line, if you live long enough, there's going to be, uh, you're going to meet a believer who's going through something you've already went through in the past. 
and you're going to be able to be there for them and help them and lead them and guide them through what you've been through maybe five years prior, ten years prior or however prior long it was learn to grow learn to allow the trial and the testing to perfect you, to complete you to where you to where you grow in your faith and You learn to understand and rest in Christ and who He is. No doubt Paul had to learn this in his trials and his tribulations in his own life. He had to learn to what? To grow spiritually. To grow spiritually. He learned this from his trials. He learned this from his testings. He even had a thorn in his own flesh that he prayed three times for it to be removed. And the Lord God said what? No, it's going to stay. It's going to prune you. It's going to prune you. It's for your better. This would be for Job's better. Your trial and your testing will be for your better down the road. Though you might not realize it going through it, but it will be for your what? Better. The Lord God says in verse 12, you may test Him. You may prove Him by trial. You say, He's got so much, He's blessed, and that's why He's following me. But I'm going to allow you to sift Him, to prove to you that he's not following me because he has so much, but he's following me because what? Because he's devoted to me. And he loves me. You can do whatever you want with everything he has, with everything he possesses. But do not harm him, what? physically but do not harm him physically you can take everything he has but do not harm him physically first peter chapter 1 verse 6 and 7 says this we looked at last week a little bit in first peter chapter 1 but verse 6 and 7 as peter's talking to the persecuted believers you remember the story we've only been through it two dozen times in verse 6, Peter says to these persecuted believers that are going through trials and tribulations, remember there's wonderful joy ahead. Even though you must endure many trials and testings for a little while, these trials will what? Will show that your faith is what? Genuine. The Lord God turns to Satan and says, put him through what you will but only at the limit that I give you and this is going to prove to you that his faith is what? Genuine. What is being tested is fire. These tests purify gold. James said, but remember this. Your faith is far more precious than gold. Your faith, your love, is far more precious than gold. Your faith and your love in the Lord God, the very one who saved you. For those of us sitting here this morning, our faith and our love for the, for the very one who has saved us is far more precious than any, any earthly possession we have. So when your faith remains strong through what? Many trials. It brings what? Praise and glory and honor. To who? To Christ. To Christ. Remember this as you go through difficult times in your life. And you will. 
The world is watching how you're going to respond. As I talked to Mr. Reitmeyer, again going back to him, I remember he said one thing. He, he said, you know, Dave, he said, for 40 some years of my life, I've, I've stood beside the bed of, of parishioners or family and friends who were dying or held the hands and gave hugs to, to those who were family and friends of others who were dying. He said, but now I'm on the other side. Now I'm on the other side. And they're watching me, how I'm going to handle these difficult times in my own life. See, we have a living hope, and it allows us to live in the most difficult of times. Our living hope is the Lord Jesus, is He not? It allows us to live in the most difficult of times. We just seen in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, 16 through 18. Christ allows us to live in the most difficult of times. The most difficult of circumstances. It's Christ. The Lord God is going to be with Job in these most difficult times, in these most difficult of circumstances. However long they last, I don't know. He's going to be there though Job might not realize it at the time. Job would eventually learn to trust God even when he doesn't know all the answers. Remember that. Job's going to learn to trust God even when Job doesn't know all the answers. Job's going to learn to trust God even when he doesn't know the reasons for why he's going through what he's going through. And you and I in our lives will go through things that will teach us to trust the Lord God even, we don't, even when we don't understand why we're going through what we're going through. When we don't have the answers to what we're going through, we'll learn to trust Him. I've said it before. Sometimes in your Christian walk when you're standing beside a loved one or a Christian friend who's going through much, sometimes it's best for us just not to say nothing and just be there as a comfort to that loved one or that, or that friend. I say that because as we move through this story, you'll see that Job's friends, it would have behooved them for the most part, to keep their mouth shut. Because some of the advice they gave wasn't the greatest advice. Do whatever you want with everything he possesses, but don't harm him physically so Satan would leave the Lord's presence. He would leave the presence of the Lord God. He would go back to patrolling the earth. But his focus would be on who? Job. He goes right at Job's possessions and his family. And this is where Job's life would do a 180 it would be flipped upside down. So as we start into the story of Job this morning, let us remember, let us remember that when trials and testing comes, no matter how they come, they must first go through who? They must first go through your Lord, your God, your Savior. And as you go through them, you will not go through them alone. Though the Lord God, it seems, would be quiet for a long period of this story. Until he finally breaks his silence, if you will. And says what? Where were you, Job? 
when I created the heavens and the earth. Let us learn from this as we close that this is a man who would learn how to rest in the Lord God. In his good times, he's done figured out. But he's going to learn how to rest in the Lord God in the tough times. And may we do the same. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we, we, we love you and we thank you for who you are, our Lord, our God. And Job's trial and his testings that he's about to be faced with, Lord God, we can, we can easily apply it to ourselves and he would have to turn to you. To the one who chose his soul, saved him from the fire of darkness. And he would learn to do that. We love you. We thank you for this communion table this morning, Lord, and that we are about to partake in. And as we've seen in the Catechism book this morning, Lord, this Lord's table points towards you and all that you've done. You've freely given yourself up for all those who would believe. It's time for us to reflect on you through this meal, examine our own selves, our devotion, our love to you. May we be accused of being upright and devoted the same way Job was. We love you and we thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.